everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. This is the Band of Books podcast, episode 97, the final episode of our reading of Luther and Erasmus. Not of the show. Well, of this part of the show. <laughs> that's on a week. That's on a week to week basis. We'll do it as long as we feel like it. I like it. <laughs> that's right. As long as 1517 keeps paying us, we'll still we'll still keep showing up. By the way, 1517 does. Uh, does help us do this show by supporting us financially. That's right, exactly. That's so you I should said. support them financially as well. 100%. If you like the show and you've liked this series so far and judging from our feedback, you do. Thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, supporting 1517 will be a good thing. And so this is episode 97, and as you heard, that's Christopher Gillespie. Chilling and willing, Max and relaxing. This is actually 13 episodes on one text. Really? That's it? Yeah, 13. 13 episodes, or as I like to call it, the future 13 chapters of my next book. <laughs> Spoilers. Spoiler alert, we've been workshopping something for the past 13 episodes. No, like I've said, I think I said this in the opening, that um, I've been asked, in fact, uh, Crucifying Religion was supposed to be a, a lay commentary on the bondage of the will. Mm. The 1517 asked me to write a book about the bondage of the will, because I've spoken on it, I've done a lot of work on it the last 22 years, 23 years. And then I said, hey, that's a great idea. I'm not up to the task, but I do have this other idea I've been carrying around in my head for 20 years. Can I do that instead? <laughs> like, like a, sure, let's see how it works. Warm-up exercise. Right. And then at Here We Still Stand, October 2019, I talked with our friend Adam Francisco, who is in charge of editing uh, books for 1517 mm-hmm. and, and giving the yay or nay to projects. And it came up again, and it was, again, the green light, like, you should really go forward with this. And I'm like, well, I think I kind of got an idea for how I want to do it, but it's such a monumental task, in, yeah. in my opinion, that I said to you, well, let's read it backwards, because the way that I learned it is I sat in my doctor father, James, Nes- James Neskin's office in the summer, and we would read it out loud to each other and then talk about it. And that's really what helped me get my mind around and get a handle on the complexities of this debate. It's almost and- harder to write like a lay commentary on a on a text like this that's so monumental. It's it's one it's monumental right and two it is such a late medieval academic form of argument. Mm, okay, yeah. That one late medieval and second academic and three as Luther points out it's pretty much the most important doctrine in all of Christian doctrine. Mm. So you don't just want to hey I'm going to write a 150 page monograph on the bondage of the will this monumental text that Luther himself said is really the only thing other than the catechism worth preserving after I die and, and be kind of flippant about it or take a kind of juvenile approach to it. Right. And, uh, I, but I do think we have to remember, we've talked about it a number of times, is that Erasmus's line of argumentation, at least according to Luther, is mm-hmm. juvenile and pedantic in itself. Right. Which then makes Luther's response to it also come off maybe a little bit like that. Like, okay, Luther, you've made your point. Right. Um, but you're he, being a little bit overly harsh. Are, are you, why do you have to be so hyperbolic? Well, and not only that, I mean, so thorough that, mm-hmm. that he does f- respond to everything Erasmus wrote. Right. And we'd rather him just skip over large chunks of it that are just kind of, yeah. you know, irrelevant. Um, right. But no, Luther, Luther will respond to every, every one of them. <laughs> Every one of those texts. Because as I said in the last episode, for Luther, at the end of the day, this is not an academic argument alone. This is a matter of pastoral care of Christians everywhere. Because what he sees in Erasmus's argument is the undoing of the comfort and hope we have in Christ Jesus, who died and rose for sinners. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. The, the corresponding, mm, the will, uh, the way that you understand your will in relation to God's Word, uh, either will... <laughs> allow you to receive justification by faith in Christ alone, or it'll undermine justification, which we would argue as Lutherans is the central doctrine of the Scripture start to finish. Right. The doctrine on which the Church stands or falls. Yeah, as it's been called. And uh, if your will gets inserted into that, it actually undermines Christ's salvation of sinners. Right, which is probably why there are so many churches that have fallen over the centuries. Hmm. Because we've replaced justification with our will. Oh, yeah. And whatever whatever form that takes, however it manifests itself. Something like, uh, you know, as sloppy as, well, Christ died to save sinners. Are you one? Well, why don't you follow Jesus? You're like, right. What would Jesus do? Well, and it's, it sounds kind of innocuous. We'll follow Jesus. You know, it's like an encouraging yeah. word. Right. Yeah, but good luck with it. Right. 
Because the but scriptures he, themselves yeah. actually reject the idea that you can follow him. Right. Or that you're going to. Well, that's kind of Jesus' whole point in John's gospel is like, where I'm going, you can't follow. So I'm going to go, I'm going to get it ready for you, and then I'm going to come back and get you. Right. Well, as if you would choose to die, to go into the grave. I mean, yeah, right. Luther did that in the last episode. We, in the last we episode. That. Yeah. Yeah. As if voluntarily you're going to submit yourself to both Jewish and Roman authorities to be yeah. crucified. Um, you know, pretty terrible way to die. Well, and that's a great point. C.S. Lewis alludes to this when he talks about being a Christian versus not being a Christian. We, we would refer to it as a theologian of glory versus a theologian of the cross, which mm. is when you make that turn towards human willing mm. in regards to salvation, you tend to present Christianity like it's uh, a steak just with melted butter dripping off of it and a glass of port wine on the side. The glory road. Yeah, it's the glory. It's like you you definitely want to be a Christian because look at this meal versus, yeah, it's going to be crawling on your hands and knees through the valley of the shadow of death to the cross where you're going to die ignominiously. Um, even your brothers and sisters in Christ, some of them are going to condemn you and think they're offering mm-hmm. worship to God when they do it. Uh, you're definitely the furthest thing from saintliness, who God calls a saint. And Satan, sin, and death are constantly going to attack and afflict you in order to drag you away from Christ. So sign up. Right, exactly. Would you please, you want to sign this waiver now? We'll give you a free mug. That's right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. All I got was this lousy t-shirt. That's right, yeah, exactly. I became a Christian, and all I got was this lousy t-shirt. <laughs> I might have to use that for one of our fundraisers coming up you through Thrivent. Should. That's awesome. <laughs> we asked Thrivent for money, and all they gave us were these lousy t-shirts. <laughs> that would be great. Uh, yes. Shout out to Thrivent, and thank you uh, for your support of what we do at this congregation. So today, as I promised, we're going to dive into Scripture, Mm. where this is ground zero. This is where it started for Erasmus and Luther, and this is where it ends for Luther. Erasmus tends to segue into human reason, Mm -hmm. because he's a humanist, and he tends to segue into the authority of the church and tradition, because he's a Roman Catholic. And where it suits his purposes, he will appeal to the Pope (laughs) and papal authority. And where it doesn't, he appeals to reason. And also to the human spirit. And the human spirit, because he is pushing a Christian philosophy, as he calls mm-hmm, it. Mm-hmm. Which and a heavy Luther, emphasis on philosophy. Which Luther will say undermines the Holy Spirit, uh, who's well, external. I think, yeah. Actually, Luther will make the argument that Christian philosophy is an oxymoron, mm. because philosophy is earthly wisdom. Mm. And Christ and is to external. to be a Christian, yeah. exactly, that's a wisdom that surpasses all human understanding. Mm. And so these two, in relation to your neighbor you can apply philosophy, that sure. is earthly wisdom. But or even to Christian. yourself. Or even to yourself. But that doesn't make it specifically Christian. Mm-mm. You are a Christian who is applying this philosophy, like I talked about in the last episode, if you're a Stoic by way of philosophy. You can apply Stoic philosophy to yourself and your neighbors, to the benefit of yourself and your neighbors. It's not going to advance you one step closer to God. Mm-mm. And yet you can still be a Christian and be a Stoic, I would argue, because as long as you hold that tension, that distinction between the two kingdoms, you can love your neighbor and you can embrace worldly wisdom, earthly wisdom in order to do that. Because again, it's still good. We're not Manichaeans here. I think we're even a little bit more subtle usually in our language, not you and I, but generally speaking as people. Sure. And that it's not, it's not about, um, it's not about earning or rewarding us with salvation, Mm -hmm. right? When we talk about our works, our virtuous living, or the way that we use wisdom um, in loving service to one another. But we do still have this sense that, well, God will be happy with me as a result. That's right. I mean, maybe, eh, you know, maybe he'll smile. Even when I'm laying in bed at night confessing to God about the sins that I'm aware of, that Mm. I've committed throughout the day, and how I know I deserve your present and eternal judgment, but, you know, for Jesus' sake, forgive me. Yeah. So he just kind of wink. (laughs) <laughs> it, yeah, exactly. Just could you kind of wink at these things that I consider? Well, actually, I don't really consider them unforgivable sins because I kind of like them. But I know you consider them unforgivable. So mm-hmm, hey, could you just mm-hmm. forgive this stuff too? Do me a solid. Mm-hmm. And this is what we do. We do this all the time. Yeah. The problem isn't the things we're aware of. It's as Paul says in Romans seven. I don't even understand my own actions. So how good of a philosopher are you then? <laughs> right. Exactly. And so this is why Dr. Luther famously can say that uh, philosophy is the queen of the virtues, Mm -hmm. love is the queen of the virtues, and yet, or reason, I'm sorry, reason is the queen of the virtues, and then simultaneously say reason is a whore. 
Well, how can she be a queen and a whore? In relation to my neighbor, reason is the queen of all the virtues. Yeah, let's be reasonable. Let's be reasonable. But in relation to God and salvation, reason is a whore. That is, she will literally sell herself to any God who comes along. And if you want to know how this works out, go read the prophet Hosea. Mm -hmm. oh, I was going to say, look in the church too, because oh. we, we confuse those, I would say almost daily, if not daily. Yeah, right. Right. Where, where it's like, well, but pastor, you said in the sermon <laughs> yes. that I'm saved no matter mm -hmm. what I do. So right. I can do whatever I want. Like, no, that's not right. very, that's not very reasonable yeah, like at all. You were doing, like you weren't doing that before the sermon. <laughs> or, yeah. Uh, well, then, I'll give you a, here's a good example, I think too, is uh, anyone who is an elder or uh, comes on church council mm, gets mm. a copy of Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willink. Right. Because we're about the business of this congregation on the council. And therefore, I want them to understand where I'm coming from, from a business philosophy, a business ethic. Once you walk into the nave, once you come to the altar, Jocko is left out of the conversation <laughs> yeah. because he doesn't contribute to your salvation. Except Only for on Jesus your, does. except for on your um, phone's wallpaper, but that's another. Well, that story. too, and <laughs> you have to door. send, you have to send it's that on, to me. It's also on the door to my office. <laughs> I'll put it in the show notes. But um, likewise, then if I say during council WWJD, everybody knows I mean what would Jocko do? <laughs> Yeah. If I say it in church, everyone goes, Pastor, are you feeling all right? Well, there's a sense that we spiritualize the earthly. So, of course we do. So because I've, like you said, I can measure, like if I read Jocko Willink's book or books, and then I implement what he talks about in his books, and I implement those in real life, and I get, and like literally I see success from them, hmm. I see that I'm accomplishing something, I can measure that, I can weigh that out, and I can, I can assess a value judgment to that. But in relation to Jesus... I'm kind of left on my own. Well, I was thinking the opposite way around is to say, well, you know, pastor, it's okay. We can run up this debt because God will take care of us. Well, that too, yeah. You're know, like, um, well, God is going to take care of you, but does is that license to be an idiot? <laughs> right. You know, is that what he yeah. is that what he's actually telling you? No, he actually yeah. there's many <laughs> many parables and sayings of Jesus about being wise as serpents right. and, and his doves. Right. Right. Well, we, we we hold the tension, and we talked about this too in the last episode, we tend to be very binary in our thinking and in our behavior, even though we love to argue that most things are gray. Mm -hmm. And the reason we want to argue that most things are gray is because we want control, but we also want an escape clause. I was going to say, we so, want control without responsibility. <laughs> exactly. So as one person has said, everyone everyone is guilty, but no one's responsible. Mm -hmm. Or, and that's why everyone's to blame. We want to blame everybody for our problems, but no one's responsible for... Or accepts responsibility. Yeah. Or accepts responsibility. And therefore, yeah, it's, it's, both, it's both and in that sense of when we apply ourselves to earthly things, we want to hold them up to God and go, but, but look at what a good boy I am. Look what I did. But then likewise, in the church, like you said, we want to apply that same, that same ethic to church to say, well, we can take out a loan for $250,000, even though... We're a congregation of 50 people mm. because God will provide. Well, maybe that's not the way that God provides. Yeah. He might provide for you by closing the congregation, liquidating your assets to pay off the debt. <laughs> Correct. And maybe you move into a storefront or someone's home or you move on to a different congregation. Yeah. Well, and that and the point is, is that, you know, we're not, I'm not trying to terrify you from making any like active decisions because you're so worried about making God, you know, doom, doom, either upset or doom. happy with you. <laughs> Right? right, and the whole point is no, no. He actually has in relation to neighbor, and I would say even in relation then to one another in the congregation, which is this strange place because mm -hmm. it has both. It's both realities at the same time. It's both spiritual Correct. and and earthly. Yeah. Um. But in regards to the earthly matters of the congregation, I mean, like you know, what do you do with your building? How do you pay right. the bills? All that kind of stuff. Um. You know, you're free to to choose and make decisions and say, you know what, we're not going to replace the roof on the steeple. We're just going to take the steeple off because that'll save us a lot of money in the long run. Right, right. You know, well, and that's what I mean though is that this either or mentality that we apply the binary way we think it does actually appeal to the Manichaean mm. uh, theology. Too, maybe because, maybe we should define Manichaean <clears throat> then, because the Manichaeans believed that the flesh was evil and that the spiritual was good, godly, divine, and. Again, Manichaeanism is an extreme form of Platonism. And Plato popularized this stuff. As Immanuel Kant said... It was like a Christianized Emmanuel, version of it, right? It is a Christianized version of Platonism. And Immanuel Kant famously said, you know, every everything in Western civilization is a footnote to Plato. All hmm. Western philosophy is a footnote to Plato. Hmm. Everybody else is just commenting on what Plato wrote. And in a certain extent, he's right. That's why I keep coming back to it. 
But the point is then that why is Plato so popular? Because he's essentially just highlighting, yeah, this is human nature. Yeah. It's observable. You can you can see it from a human experience. I'm yeah, he's just, super I, reasonable. He's a little yeah, idealistic, he just, but he... <laughs> yes, he is. That's why the Stoics are like, yeah, we reject that. It's too idealistic. It's mm-hmm. too pie in the sky. Let's get more practical here, buddy. But that's why for those of us, as we were talking before we hit record again, um, for those of us who maybe have an obsessive personality type, mm. the Stoics appeal to us because I can read it and immediately put it into practice and it constantly drives me forward. It pushes me forward. It, okay, so the objective part about it is the day-to-day. Yes. The, the yes. subjective is like the end result, and maybe in a way of like similar to Buddhism, um, they actually don't know where the journey is going to take you exactly. Right. Uh, you might have some goals along the way. All you, that matters is the intent. Mm-hmm, right. So just take action today. Correct. You know, and, and do that in a, in a morally responsible way. Right. And see where it takes you. Well, and, you know, not to get too far off the rabbit trail, but... Um, a lot of what we understand by modern Buddhism probably was taken from the Greeks through Alexander. <laughs> and that's why. That's why if you read Buddhism and you're familiar with Plato, you'll see a lot of connections. And I think that's a reason. And it's like martial arts. The term martial, Mar is the god of war. This is the art of war. Well, where does martial arts originate? Well, somewhere around India or um, southern China. But if you really look at it and you look at the development of martial arts, it actually comes from Greece. Mm-hmm. And it was taken east with Alexander. Yeah, it's the training of the warriors of the city. Yeah, exactly. And so Pancrase, for example, which we would call it combat jujitsu in the present tense or or slap fighting on the ground. <laughs> it has its roots in Pancrase. It's a combination of wrestling and striking. And then you look at different forms of martial arts in India and China and Japan and so forth and, and it's, it's, tr- its migration. It's from the Greeks. Mm-hmm. You, you see this. And so, of course, when you, when you articulate and express yourself in a way that really nails human nature and how we think and how we act and how we experience and interact with the world, it's not going to just be here for a moment and then mm. disappear. Mm-hmm. It's going to be taken up and translated into theology, into other philosophies, into other cultures, and spun out. And so, that's why when you study religions or study philosophies, you will find touch points, you'll find similarities. Because human beings are incredibly uncreative and un, well, just unimaginative. Well, it's like Luther's insult at the end of last episode of uh, Erasmus yeah. being a Pelagian. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's a oh, it's just there's nothing new under the sun. We had the same thing happen now. People right. love thinking like Erasmus, even though they probably don't even know who he is. Exactly. You know, because it's and mm, maybe it's like you say we're not that creative, but we're also very hopeful at the same time. And our hopes yeah. haven't really changed, <laughs> right? Well, that's the tra- I think that's the tragedy of human existence is that we imagine that we are really creative and imaginative, and that we're doing things that no one has ever thought of to do before. And then if you just read Thucydides, <laughs> you'll find out that yeah, we we just keep repeating the same thing over and over. We just mm-hmm. put on a different mask and dress it up in different clothes. Yep. Which brings us to this point then, which is how many times for you listening, have you heard a pastor or someone say in a Bible study, for example, well, what does this mean to you? Hmm. An ambiguous statement that will result in maybe a multitude of different answers. Hmm. And that comes from Erasmus. I did say in Bible class on Sunday, I don't really know what this means. (laughs) Right. Which is a great thing for a pastor to say every once in a while, but like, I have no idea what this means. God right. came to kill Ra- uh, Moses in the night, but his wife cut off his foreskin and rubbed the blood on the on his feet. What does this mean, Pastor? I have no idea. <laughs> and by the way, there's nothing after that or before that. It just happened. And then they treat it like, yeah, that's just what God does. All right. <laughs> now we move on. <laughs> Could you provide some context or a parentheses, just anything? Yeah. Nope. Yeah. It just happened and we moved on. No, but that's, not, that's the opposite, right? Rather than it's, uh, in humbly saying... Um, this is not clear to me today. We're yes. not presuming the text itself isn't clear. Nope. We're just saying we don't understand it. I Our, don't understand it. Yeah, I'm blind to it. Right. Um, I'm not oh, saying the author was or the I Holy read Spirit notes is. from 10 years ago that I made to myself that I look at today. I'm like, huh, when between now and then did God reveal to me this text? Because 10 years ago I wrote, I don't understand this text. And today I'm teaching this all the time. I have the opposite problem. 10 years ago, I wrote something down, and today I look at it, I'm like, oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> why don't, why didn't I remember it? <laughs> I completely forgot. Did I write this? Where did I get this? I used this? to be so much smarter before kids. Yeah, that's true. It's all the brain cells are just being slowly, like, like the calcium 
in, in my, <laughs> in my <right>. wife's body. <laughs> yes. <laughs> leached into the kid's bones. Yes. Mm. So this is then in Roop, page 158, Scripture with its internal and external clarity as the test of truth, which again, in and of itself is problematic in the pres- present tense because we don't actually believe in the truth anymore. Or clarity. We, or clarity. We believe in truths. Find your own truth. And clarity, well, you know, it may be clear to you, but it's not clear to me. Plus, um, if I think I remember where Luther goes with this, um, we flip it. We would say internal is more Correct. important than external. Correct. Mm-hmm. So Luther writes then in response to Erasmus on this. And again, Erasmus, to summarize his argument, uh, Scripture is ambiguous and confusing. And that's why it's important that you have someone like an Erasmus interpret it for you. Even though me, Erasmus, I don't understand it. But you should, or at least I'm not going to admit that I admit it, I understand it, even though I'm going to write and talk as if I am actually an authority because I do understand this. Right. But like I said, if if it's not clear to you, the problem isn't with the text. The problem is with you. Correct. Right. And the danger of the old Adam is to be possessed by hubris in such a way that you take up the Erasmian position, which is, well, only I can interpret this correctly for you. Or I would also say um, that all Scripture is... Hmm. understandable by reason, and put it that way, that sure. you can figure everything out. Yeah, if you just read this commentary or read this guy over here, or this woman said this, or listen to this lecture, you got it. You got so it. Maybe, maybe we could put it this way, that you can master the text. Yeah. Whether I would actually suggest the text masters you. Which or, would be overstanding the text rather than understanding Yeah, there the you text. go. That's a good way to put it. So what then are we to do, Luther writes? The church is hidden. The saints are unknown. Well, could probably just stop right there. <laughs> That's a whole episode. Yeah. One, the church is hidden. It's not invisible. It is hidden, and it is only revealed to faith, mm-hmm. which again means that we are passive. Because how does we get faith? Through hearing, and how do we get hearing? Through the Word of God. And the saints are unknown, as he talks about at the end, that those who God calls saints are the furthest thing from saintliness. So what do we do? Well, we argue that the church is revealed and is visible, here, there, and wherever I'm at, Mm -hmm. and that the saints are known by their works, or we will know them by their love, by their love, as the hymn sings. Why do we do that? Because we want to be in control. Mm -hmm. Well, and and we want confidence um, based off of what we can see and touch and feel. How do I know if I'm doing the right thing? How do I know if I'm advancing toward heaven or hell if I can't measure my progress based on what I see? Right, and this is what's led uh, to the really more recent phenomena of church shopping. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Because we have the we have the luxury of of uh, mobility. Yeah, and so and we go around, and I know people that just can't find the right church, and yeah. even among their own tradition, even within like one tradition, right? yeah, they they drive they try to visit them all. They drive past four churches to find the one that's right for them. Oh yeah, no, I have people that drive sixty sixty five miles to come to our congregation on Sunday morning. They drive by a lot of churches. Right, and I'm not saying that all those churches were faithful, right, and that you shouldn't drive by them. <laughs> yeah, right. It's very possible. But but on the other hand, there are, mm-hmm, I, we have these very high standards where or we're very hopeful that we can find some, you know, idyllic place on earth. Exactly, an idyllic place. Yeah. A platonic ideal. Mm. A utopia that is in no that. place. Yeah. yeah. So the church is hidden. The saints are unknown. What and whom are we to believe? Or, as you very pointedly argue, Erasmus, who gives us certainty? How shall we prove the Spirit? If you look for learning, on both sides there are scholars. If you are looking for quality of life, on both sides there are sinners. If you are looking for Scripture, both sides acknowledge Scripture. But the dispute is not so much about Scripture, which may not yet be sufficiently clear, as about the meaning of Scripture, and on both sides are men, of whom neither numbers nor learning nor dignity, much less fewness, ignorance, and humility, have anything to do with the case. Well, that's a German sentence, if there ever was Isn't one. Isn't it? I thought I skipped a line there. No, I saw you slow down. I'm like, and this was written yeah. in Latin, but it's still... Yeah. No, it's very German. No, I slowed down because I'm like, did I skip a line? I don't nope. think I skipped a line. My eyes literally started going cross reading that. So we're not arguing about Scripture, you know, abstractly, but rather, what does it mean? Right. And how does that apply? So yeah, if you, if you want to prove this, if you want to prove that the Holy Spirit's in this church or that these people are saints and they've got the Spirit, well, there's people on both sides that will argue for and against what you're arguing for. Yeah, and externally it looks like like they are true right. Christians, they have 
the, the spirit. Right. Yeah. But if you want to argue about the quality of the life of a Christian, guess what? On both sides, there are sinners arguing for the quality of life of a Christian. Mm, yeah. If you want to argue for the clarity of Scripture, both sides acknowledge that Scripture is clear or just that Scripture is the Word of God, even if it's not sufficiently clear to them. How about the meaning of Scripture? There's people on both sides that will tell you it's the meaning is very clear, the meaning is completely unclear. Yeah. There, we have numbers on both sides, learning, dignity, there's, you know, there's a few people here, there's ignorance, there's humility. I mean, you can make a case on either side for the clarity of Scripture or the ambiguity of Scripture. By reason and sense, though. Yeah, just by, yeah, just by reason and sense. The matter, therefore, remains in doubt, and the case is still sub judici or udici. What do you want to say? Uh, are you ecclesiastical or are you attic or whatever? Right. Sub, under, and then Judas or Eudice. From He's actually quoting Horace in the Poetics. So that it looks as if we might be wise to adopt the position of the skeptics, unless the line you take is best, when you express your uncertainty in such a way as to aver that you are seeking to learn the truth. Though in the meantime you incline to the side that asserts free choice until the truth becomes clear. I think Luther's got to be playing with him here. He this, is. This back and forth, this back and, you know, logic. Yeah. Just, well, we could say this, or you could say this. And you could, Well, remember, this is the beginning of this too, though. This is the beginning of the treatise. So this is definitely where he hits him hard. And as he goes, he becomes more and more redundant because he's just, he's arguing scripturally as we go, right? So like when we start at the end, it's just scripture passage after scripture passage. Mm -hmm. But notice here... There are scripture passages that Luther cites, but they are few and far between. Yeah, it's more of, uh, um, I think he's playing with the, the the manner or the mean means of argumentation, not necessarily right. he, the yeah, actual exactly. argument. He's, yeah, he's like, here's the rules of the game. Mm. Here's the rules of engagement. I get it. So this is why I recommend Roop, even though the translation is a little bit more wooden than Packer and Johnston, is because Roop includes the Erasmus text. And it's... And as we read this, this is, I think, why so many people are actually turned off from reading the bondage of the wells, because this first part on scripture, it's wordy, and yeah. it's dense, and it's really difficult to get into the argument from this position, because you're you're basically trying to get through this to the easier stuff that comes like 40, after it. 50 but pages. It is. Yeah. But think about it this way. Luther has to establish the rules of scriptural interpretation before he can start interpreting scripture. So all the heavy liftings on the front end of this debate, mm, okay. these are the rules. These are my hermeneutics by which I will then exposit scripture to confute, to contradict, to counter your argument for free choice. It's like in your book where you put the, it was an appendix at the end, how to read the Correct. Bible. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I, I had to, actually, they didn't even want that in there. And I insisted. So Yeah. Because like, yeah, you just wrote on, the, you just wrote about your experience in theology, but what happens if I want to read the Bible? <laughs> like, how am I supposed to read this? Well, that's a great point. Mm -hmm. Well, and this is not this is not foreign. I, I think people know that you need not an interpretive key. That's the wrong way to put it, because it sounds again as if the scripture itself is not clear, and you need something to clarify it for you. Um, but how you approach the Bible itself mm -hmm. is completely relevant, and I think people know this. I mean, even the Gideons do, right? They put Bibles everywhere. It's yeah. not like as if the Bible's just there, laying there, and you're just supposed to open it and find a page. Right. What people do, because you flip to the back, it tells you exactly how to read it according to their. Well, think about scheme. this way. To your point, there I would actually argue in favor of an interpretive key. And in fact, I would publish, like, emboss on the front of every Bible. You search the scriptures because you think in them mm, okay. they'll find life, but they're, they testify to me. Like, like, John's gospel, like, all of John's gospel is essentially Jesus saying, I'm actually the only correct interpreter of scripture because I'm the one who actually spoke it into new existence. Right, the prologue is the interpretive key. Exactly, so... That's why I would say is like rhetorically, it's not clear either because you can go into the Old Testament and read rhetorically. This is the history of Israel, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. No, it's not. It's the history of of Jesus and salvation. Well, the new Israel, if you like, the church. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you don't know that until you get to Romans, and you're like, oh, it seems like from Paul's argument that he's saying that that the history of Israel is actually the history of Jesus. Yeah, and it's like rhetorically you can understand that, but you can read that in John and Jesus saying, yeah, actually, that they testify to me. Well, this is the problem. We've been reading through John, and we lack the the hermeneutic. Well, we have the hermeneutic. We know all the scriptures testify of him. We know that yeah. these things are written that you would believe that Jesus is the Christ, right? That's right, John's exactly. hermeneutic at the end. Yeah. And, uh, 
But what we lack, actually, maybe ironically now, is we don't have the scriptures. So we don't even right. know the Old Testament. And yeah. so there's there's this common like thing that gets tried you know, trotted out about how John is written writing to a Greek audience because he's using all these Greek philosophical yeah, terms right. or something. And you're like, did you actually read it? Right, I was going to say, because he's attacking the rabbis hard. Yeah, it's the rabbis, and he's and it's in the context of feasts and festivals, Jewish feasts and festivals that Correct. are full of yeah. meaning and, yeah. um, and history. So That's a great point, actually, and you brought that up before, is that if you, the, John's gospel is basically laid out like a calendar. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You can literally follow the Jewish feasts and festivals, and Jesus just constantly subverting every single one of them. There's kind of a gap between, I think it was chapter six and seven, but but overall, yeah, it's pretty yeah. it's pretty linear. Um, and, you know, the fact that Jesus doesn't go up, we're in chapter seven, so the Feast of Tabernacles, he mm-hmm. doesn't go up at the beginning of the feast. Then he goes up at the middle, and then, yeah. he, then he makes some really profound statements at the end. They're like, well, this this maybe it matters. Why would John keep telling you what part of the feast he's at? What's happening right. on that day? Right. When he says, you know, if you thirst, come to me, and I'll you know give you a drink of of the water. Like, what part of the Feast of Tabernacles? What was happening on the seventh day? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, there's a whole <laughs> bit with pool Siloam and taking water and her, into yes, the exactly. Temple. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, not having that background, one, right. it makes the text kind of well, it does make it unintelligible in a lot of ways. You're just like, why is right. Jesus saying that? Yeah. You know, but if you know what was happening on that day, which you right. should, if you, <laughs> you know. Right. Well, there's that problem. You should. <laughs> yeah, which you should. Um, then then it actually, oh, well, it not only does it make sense, but it but it's rich in meaning, right? Correct. And, and, and actually profound. Right. And that's the point is that, yeah, rhetorically, it might be clear to the to the naked eye. You can read it and be like, yeah, it's about the history mm-hmm. of Israel or John's mm-hmm. Gospels, Jesus saying a whole bunch of things that don't really make any sense, but... He's Jesus, I guess he's claiming that he's special. But then the internal clarity, that is the spiritual, the the, the clarity of scripture that the spirit opens up that reveals to us, oh, yeah. this is all about Jesus, and that, oh, he's leading us, he's leading us through the history of Israel, taking it all captive to well, mm-hmm. the actual point. Then all of a sudden you're like, Well, which is it? And it's like, well, it's actually both at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And that's good. So like he's like Luther says, you know, to this I reply about, you know, you have this side that takes this position, but there's an equal number of people on the other side that will take the opposite position. There's something in what you say, but not the whole truth. Mm-hmm. Again, you have you've got external clarity, but you you lack internal clarity. Which Erasmus writes to Zwingli after this and goes, I don't understand what he's talking about. <laughs> which proves the point. Like Luther's like, you don't understand. There's two kinds of clarity, and even Erasmus is like, I don't understand what he's talking about. What do you? What does he mean? Like the clarity according to the spirit, and then clarity according to the, the you know reason. It's like well, I don't understand, because again, faith equals understanding for Erasmus. Ah, uh, yes, and and really, then, yeah, the spirit's work is to give understanding, not to give faith. Correct. Okay. Exactly, and understanding that then manifests in the right behavior. There's no reason for the humanist to understand something if it's not applied to your life. This is their this is their oh, attack okay. against like nominalism or something like late medieval schools of, of theology is like all you care about is debating theology and talking about doctrine and arguing about how many angels uh, you know can be put on the head of a pin or can God create a rock that he can't lift what we need is practical wisdom we need to be given doctrine that we can apply in our day-to-day lives never heard that before yeah right huh again Erasmus won the war hmm So then Luther continues, we shall not prove the spirits by arguments about learning, life, talent, numbers, dignity, ignorance, crudity, rarity, and lowliness. Nor do I approve of those who have recourse to boasting of the spirit. For I've had this year and am still having a sharp enough fight with those fanatics who subject the scriptures to the interpretation of their own spirit. He's referring to the Schwermer, the enthusiasts, as they're called, the God with inners. Zwingli being um, one, right? Zwingli being one of them that he encounters in the spring of 1522, and then he had uh, more recently attacked in the, his book Against the Heavenly Prophets in 1525, which is a brilliant treatise, by the way, mm-hmm. Against the Heavenly Prophets. Definitely worth reading in the present tense, especially in the context of worship wars and in the context of how do you interpret scripture? How do you read the Bible? Yeah. Because he addresses all that stuff. So, I've had enough problems with these people, and i got to deal with you too about the whole matter of the Scripture. <laughs> it is on this account also that I have hitherto attacked the Pope, in whose kingdom nothing is more commonly stated or more generally accepted than the idea that the Scriptures are obscure and ambiguous, so that the Spirit, 
small s spirit, to interpret them must be sought from the apostolic see of Rome, meaning the Pope. So we call it trickle-down economics. So he's kind of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Hmm. He's the vicar of Christ on earth. Got it. If the Pope says it, Jesus said it. And then it just trickles down. Nothing more pernicious could be said than this, for it has led ungodly men to set themselves above the scriptures and to fabricate whatever they pleased until the scriptures have been completely trampled down and we have been believing and teaching nothing but the dreams of madmen. In a word, that saying is no human invention, but a virus sent into the world by the incredible malice of the prince of all demons himself. Ooh. That's Tell intense. us what you really think, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Way to start your argument. So what we say is this. The spirits are to be tested or proved by two sorts of judgment. One is internal, whereby through the Holy Spirit or a special gift of God, anyone who is enlightened concerning himself and his own salvation judges and discerns with the greatest certainty the dogmas and opinions of all men. Of this, it is said in 1 Corinthians 1, or chapter 2, verse 15, depending on your Bible. <laughs> That's Luther. I love how he That's does Luther, that. That's Luther, yeah. yeah somewhere, spiritual... somewhere in 1 Corinthians. Yeah, or, or the second or chapter. Or Paul or Peter, or I don't know. Right. Yeah. Somebody. The spiritual man judges all things, but himself is judged by no one. Hmm. This belongs to faith and is necessary for every individual Christian. We have called it above, quote, the internal clarity of Holy Scripture. So the internal clarity of Holy Scripture is just that, that the Holy Spirit enlightens each Christian with the, for lack of a better term, knowledge. That is the intimacy of knowledge, yada in Hebrew, intimate knowledge of this is who you are. Mm-hmm. And this is who I am, and this is what I'm going to do for you. This is God, how he reveals himself and wants to be preached, worshipped, and offered to. Would, would we say this is also, um, you know, <laughs> when it gets uncomfortable, when things start to spin out and, and say we read, hmm, what's a favorite story of yours? Oh, Naaman, right? And, yeah. and his washings, right, in the, yeah. in the River Jordan. And it's an Old Testament text. It's long before the baptism of Jesus or the institution of baptism. Yeah. But internally... We can't help but it's say totally about yeah, this is this is about baptism yeah. yeah or the flood even right I mean this is baptism this right is, it's got the dying of, of of sinner and the rising of new life you know right. well it worked for Peter <laughs> yeah there's that he saw the parallel it did and uh, we and you don't need Peter though to get there no you just need the Spirit this is why we talked about we've talked about this and joked about Philip reading the scroll of Isaiah mm, right. and then saying to the Ethiopian eunuch yeah it's totally about baptism. And you're like, where, the eunuch where in, says it to Philip. Actually. That's right. Yeah, the eunuch says it to Philip. It's like, where in Isaiah do you get baptism? I mean, there's from the suffering there's servant. There's wells of salvation in there. So there, exactly. There's that must wells be of it. salvation. Yeah. That so maybe this it. irrigation ditch or whatever this is right here. Uh huh. Yeah, that's what it is. That's what this is. Huh. But it's like I've said, the old Adam hears, if you believe and are baptized, you will be saved. He hangs everything on if. Mm -hmm. Well, if I believe, isn't that enough? The new man in Christ hangs everything on will be saved. He hangs mm -hmm. everything on the promise. Yeah. That's the difference between internal and external clarity. Right, right. So the spiritual man judges all things, but himself is judged by no one. This belongs to faith and is necessary for every individual question, and we've called it the internal clarity of Scripture. Perhaps this was what those had in mind who gave you the reply that everything must be decided by the judgment of the Spirit, capital S Spirit. But this judgment helps no one else, and with it we are not here concerned. For no one, I think, doubts its reality. Hmm. You know, would anybody argue that you need the judgment of the Spirit to understand Scripture? It does come, right? But it, yeah. But it it ultimately ultimately is what when when the, the Christian says, "I believe this," correct? And that cannot hmm. be, hmm, that can't be worked through through reason, argumentation, or knowledge, right? Okay. Well, yeah, I just I was talking with a uh, friend last night. I said, because he said, you know, from reading your book, I've stopped arguing with other people <laughs> about Christianity and arguing with other faiths about becoming Christians. And I texted back, I'm like, yeah, you can't argue someone into faith. No. That's impossible. And like we talked about in the last episode regarding apologetics. Oh, you might right. Be able yeah. to, you, maybe you can argue them to the church door because they just want to get, you know, maybe they, they love you or you're, they're friends enough with you that they're just gonna be like, you know what? I'm tired of arguing with you about this. Let's just go to church so I can see for myself. You can argue against the things that they've set up in the way of Christ. Yeah, absolutely. But you can't argue them for Christ. Correct. 
I mean, you can make the case, I suppose. <laughs> you lay Christ before him. That's what we do Isn't in preaching. is a book called Making the Case for Christ from the 70s? <laughs> I think there's a Christian po- <laughs> No, it's not from the 70s. It's from, uh, it's from Craig Parton, isn't it? That's right. Yeah, yeah. Is it Craig? <sighs> yeah, you guys know. There we go. So, there is therefore another an external judgment whereby with the greatest certainty we judge the spirits and dogma of all men, not only for ourselves, but also for others and for their salvation. This judgment belongs to the public ministry of the word and to the outward office, and is chiefly the concern of leaders and preachers of the word. Mm -hmm. We make use of it when we seek to strengthen those who are weak in faith and confute opponents. So we just talked about that. This is what we earlier called the external clarity of Holy Scripture. Thus we say that all spirits are to be tested in the presence of the church at the bar of Scripture. That's not bar as in where they serve drinks and you shoot darts or throw darts or shoot pool. Is this theology on tap? Yeah, right. No, this is bar as in canon, as in measure of Scripture. For it ought above all to be settled and established among Christians that the Holy Scriptures are a spiritual light far brighter than the sun itself, especially in things that are necessary to salvation. But because we have for so long been persuaded of the opposite by that pestilential saying of the sophists that the scriptures are obscure and ambiguous, we are obliged to begin by proving even that first principle of ours by which everything else has to be proved. A procedure that among the philosophers would be regarded as absurd and impossible. Hmm. So uh, he says this relates to the public ministry of the word, to preaching. Mm-hmm. Uh, to the outward office, and, and so this is this is something that makes people actually uncomfortable. I'd say with our preaching, with um, specifically Lutheran preaching, but I would say evangelical that we preaching. make assertions, right? And we tell people, "You are saved. Yeah. Jesus died for you. You are baptized." Well, worse yet, I sometimes preach in the first person mm. because Scripture does. Again, you read the prophet Isaiah, for example. Thus saith the Lord, I, even I. Oh, will right. save you. I just do that. Was that was a couple episodes. I, I recalled doing that too for the congregation yeah. a couple weeks ago. That'll yeah. really freak people out who aren't used to it. And they're like, did you just claim to be Jesus up there? I'm like, no, mm. I quoted the word of God to you. Mm-hmm. But I am here to speak for Jesus. Right. I am an instrument of the word. Right. But you've been given the words to say, and, yes. and you can say them. Uh, this this is really important, actually, that... Yeah. Um, that uh, so much of what we do is sub- is subjective, Right. It's yes. like, well, what does this mean to you, or how does this make you feel? Mm-hmm. And and then we come along, maybe because we're type A, you know, males, but mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> we say, no, this is what is. Yeah. And then they say, well, I don't believe that. And then okay. I say, this is what is. <laughs> exactly. Well, I said, you know, we, we had a woman come to Bible study. She was a visitor. She came, and I quoted the name and text, and she disagreed with it because for Naaman to go back and go into the temple and bow, bend his knee in mm-hmm. front of this false god is syncretism. It's unionism. It's false worship. Mm-hmm. And God would never allow that. And I said, well, the text is clear, right? Well, yes. And therefore, what I'm saying about the text is, is it correct in your opinion? Yeah, you're, you're, you're correctly, you know, explaining the text as what the text says. Mm-hmm. I said, well, then what's your, what's your issue? I don't agree with this. Okay, <laughs> then we're done. Yeah. If the text is clear and you you acknowledge that my interpretation of this text is also clear and true, according to the word, and yet you still choose to disagree that this is what God would allow to happen, even though the prophet himself says this is what is. I know what you're saying should be. We talked about perception and observation in the last episode. You know, that I, I know what the way you think things should be in the present tense, mm-hmm. but that's just not the way it is. Yeah, no, I, I can see the line of argumentation because... Um, I, if I'm guessing here correctly, she's saying, you say it's about baptism, but then look at the life he lives. Yes. So how could it be about baptism? Because right. he, he doesn't live the life of the, of, of the quote-unquote Christian. As we live it. it. The royal we, the editorial we. Right, which isn't actually true. I mean, mm-hmm. how many people, um, okay, we'll just speak first person, uh, you know, how often have I lived um, as if my baptism didn't matter? Right. Or didn't didn't do anything or it isn't a, you know what god said about it isn't actually true that i'm not yeah. his child right well yes does that make the va- baptism invalid all the words that he did say right did, am i calling god a liar well maybe by my actions but is god a liar then because 
can I can I revoke the effect, efficacy of God's word? <laughs> right, and the answer is no, <laughs> no, because it's external. I mean, I think that's where Luther's going with this, is yeah. that it actually isn't dependent upon you. Right, we want it to be. That's the point. Hmm. We we want it to be. That is and, synergism. Then I suppose you know cooperation. What is that? Soon ergos, right? Yeah, to work with. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And maybe uh, it's forty-five minutes. I lied. We're gonna have to do two more episodes on this topic. I think because mm. I do think it's really important. And if I go back, Luther gives a it a bit, lot of time. He does, and and this is on page one fifty-eight, and on page one hundred nine, he talks about the clarity of Scripture, and it he goes into Proteus, he goes into asserting Christ. And it really, for him, and it's just a short section, it's like three pages, it basically sets up, it is vital to know the truth about free choice. And so if we don't have a firm grasp on how to interpret, how we read scripture, and how we understand scripture, and how it speaks to us, or how it doesn't speak to us, how we speak to, Chris, to scripture, mm. then, and there's also an absolution that he, he pronounces absolution to Erasmus on page 109, where he says, I absolve your heart so long as you display it no further. Mm. That is, I forgive you your emotionalism, so long as you stop doing that. <laughs> so I think we're going to have to do two more, and maybe... That'd be again, actually nice, because then we'll move on at episode 100. Ooh, See? bang! You like that? I like that. Look at you. Makes it seem like like we... In, That's you know, why you're the producer. Intentionally did it. Plus, who wants in on 13? Right. right. Some kind of like myth. Right. There's some something attached to that. Right, I don't know. right. Superstition. But yeah, like yeah. Judas's birthday was July 13th or something. Or? Was it? <laughs> No, mine is. <laughs> but the point is that there is some stuff that we like. Well, he says, you know, the true church is hidden. Saints aren't saintly. The scripture is clear. Well, there's two sections. One, the true church doesn't err, but it's hidden from our sight. We should probably and deal with that. that yeah. And then that section on, yeah, there's there's the clarity of scripture that's super important. And like the clarity of scripture, obviously, that we've been treating in this past 47 minutes. So yeah, we're going to do two more episodes. <laughs> We've got to. Cuz we just can't we can't stop right here and leave people going, "Well, wait a minute. You're talking about the clarity of scripture and internal external clarity and you're just going to stop right there and not talk about it some more mm. when literally this is the way that I've grown up reading the Bible or this is right. every Sunday in church and Bible study or this is how my pastor preaches. Well, we've tried to model it for you as we've, you know, read other authors relate to scripture and try to help. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. But um but maybe speaking about it very directly here you know, in a systematic kind of way is going to be helpful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think so too. Okay. So we'll do that. We'll come back next week for two more episodes on the topic of scripture and its clarity and on how then we look at the church and go, yeah, we can't really see it. It has to be revealed to us. Which is a common criticism of the church. So it's worth also de digging into 100%. that, the hypocrisy of the, of the visible church. Exactly. So mm -hmm. thank you for your time and attention again. Thank you for persisting with us. I hope that this has been a great benefit to you, if nothing else, even if you never read The Bondage of the Will, you get from these podcasts enough to really get you thinking and questioning your own presuppositions and so forth. And again, that at the end of the day, we're just trying to clear everything away that gets between you and Jesus being delivered for you for the forgiveness of sin. All that spiritual deadwood. All that spiritual deadwood out of the way. It's all about the gifts in Jesus. Thank you. We'll see you next time. Peace.